Let us pray. Gracious God, we know that you come in peace and justice with the coming of Christ, and we look forward to those things soon being with us with the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all that it represents, for the opportunity to gather in your holy name. And I pray that the words of my mouth and all of our thoughts and prayers are pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Wonderful music. Thank you. Great. Beautiful. The, the offertory and the anthem. A lovely day. Everything we celebrate today. And in the spirit of our dedications, I'm going to go out on a limb and... Uh, say that having a child changes your life. Anybody want to push back on that at all? I think back to, to, to when our, we were expecting our first child and thinking about not only does a child change your life, but just to get to the point where the child comes, the child arrives, there's all kinds of changes to take place. 17 years ago in the months leading up to, 17 years ago in the months leading up to the birth of our first child, I think to the ways Amy and I changed. You know, we changed what we were reading, for example. We've always been avid readers, she and I. We read a lot. But when we found out we were going to have a baby, uh, we read different things. She, what to expect when you're expecting, what to expect in the first year. She was learning how to bond with the baby. I, the expectant father, how to save for college, right? <laughs> True, that's what was in the book, you know. We read all manner of baby name books, and if you haven't been shopping, there's more than one that you can buy, right? We read articles on parenting and childhood and, and all of that, including one of my favorites said something like this, 2001's top uh, coveted must-have items for your new baby. Number seven or eight on that list, I still remember, was a colorful, decorative plastic cover for your baby white box. Right. <laughs> so no one has to look at that unsightly thing. Like, heaven forbid, a diaper might be changed, right, somewhere in the vicinity. We changed our house. We started bringing in new furniture, a crib, of course, a glider rocker for nursing, changing table. And then a year later, when the baby became a toddler, we took all the breakables out. <laughs> you know, because we know what happens to, when toddlers get a hold of those low shelves. We changed our room. We changed the layout of our house. We, gave, we were fortunate enough in our star starter home to give one whole room to the baby. The baby's room. While Amy was resting in the last trimester of pregnancy, I took it upon myself to paint the baby's room. It was glorious. Two shades of gold, the accent wall, because in 2001, that's what all the designer shows said you had to do. We had an elaborate six-colored stencil of Noah's Ark as on the chair rail going around. I, I grew weary with fatigue and gave up, by the way, after the fourth color. So, true, this is true, our animals came on one by one. <laughs> and none of them had eyeballs. Right? <laughs> changes, right? We change. Everything changes when a, just to get ready for the baby to come. And, of course, those are superficial things, right? I mean, they're, they're intentional, and we take them very seriously, but they're really on the surface, right? I mean... They're external things. They really pale in comparison to how the baby changes us socially, emotionally, financially, logistically, right, in all of these other ways. They pale in comparison to that. And that's where we left off a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago. We talked about Mary and Joseph. And we said whatever plans they might have had for their future, they changed dramatically the moment they learned that they were bringing a baby into the world. Everything changed. Everything changed for them. Well, today, we're moving ahead in time, about 30 years. We're zipping way ahead in Scripture and we're not talking about Jesus directly, but we're talking about his cousin named John. 
Jesus had an older cousin named John. He's nicknamed John the Baptist. The Baptist wasn't his last name. Right? It was his nickname because he was baptizing people. John, the Bible says, was also filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. God laid hands on John and gave him a special purpose, and that purpose was this. When the two boys, Jesus and John, would become 30 years old, John would go first. John would be the first preacher to visit people, to, to, to talk to people, and he was there to go before Jesus to prepare the way. So his job was to go get everybody ready to receive Christ who was to come. Everybody with me? He was there to get people ready. And that's why we talk about him here as we get ready for Christmas. Christmas is our remembrance of Christ coming into the world. So we always, before we meet Christ at Christmas, we talk about John the Baptist because he's there to help us in these last few days before Christmas get ready for Christmas spiritually spiritually. So our goal today is to learn from John the Baptist about getting ourselves ready for the coming of Christ. And I'm going to share a short scripture with us from the Gospel of Luke. If you want to read along with me, you can. Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. And the context is John, the cousin of Jesus, is about 30 years old. And he's left the town and the urban area, and he's gone out into the countryside, which is really kind of a desert, rocky, sandy. There's a river that goes through the desert called the Jordan River, and he's preaching to everybody, and he's telling, and he's baptizing them. That's where the nickname comes from. He's preaching, and he's baptizing, and here's what the Gospel of Luke says. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able to raise up from these stones children of Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what should we do? And in reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats should, should, give to, should, should share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to him and said, what should we do? And he said, collect from people no more than they owe you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, but be satisfied with your wages. The word of God for the people of God. So I'm going to just recap this briefly this way. John comes preaching and tells the people to repent. Say that word with me. Repent. repent. That word repentance or repent means to change. Quite basically, change. Or another way we think of it is turning around. Right? Change your direction. Change your direction in life. It literally means change the way you think and understand. So John is saying... In order to receive Christ, to prepare ourselves to receive Christ, we need to look within ourselves and ask what needs to change in us in order that there's room to receive Christ. That's how we prepare spiritually for Christmas. We've got shopping down pat. We got that preparation done. The spiritual preparation is looking within ourselves, saying what needs to change about us in order that we might receive Christ fully when he comes. And when John did that, that day in the wilderness, three groups of people came up to him and asked him, what should we do? The first group were the crowds in general, the crowds in general. And then the second group were the tax collectors. And the third group were the soldiers. Each of them came up and said, okay, we believe you. John, we hear you saying we've got to repent, 
uh, change, something about ourselves in order to receive Christ. We're on, on, on board with that. But help us now, John. What should we do? What should we do to change? And so John is very clear with his answers. He gives them very quickly. First of all, to the crowds, he says, whoever among you has two coats, give one away. And do the same with food. Two cans of food, give one food away. Right? In, in, in other words, do that with everything. Whatever you have in excess, give the excess away and keep only what you need. And then the tax collectors say, well, what about us? What should we do? Collect from people only what they owe you. Duh. Right? <laughs> Makes sense. But the reality was tax collectors were not doing that. They were overcharging people and pocketing the excess. So this is the change he's asking them to do. Right? Only collect what is really owed you. And then the soldiers, they say, what should we do? And he said, these were mercenary soldiers that hired themselves out to fight. And they would sometimes play bidders against each other and drive the price up for their services. And so he said, don't extort money from people that way. Be satisfied with your wages. Honor the contract and the commitment that you made. Straightforward, right? Pretty good? Don't be greedy. Don't cheat and steal. Don't abuse. Good advice. But I would say that if we take John at this literal level, then we'd be tempted to think that what it means to, to receive Christ is don't be greedy, don't cheat and steal, don't abuse. That's all there is. But then we'd say, that's an awfully low bar, isn't it? I mean, that, that's, that, isn't that the bare minimum of what it takes to be a civil, decent human being? I mean, let alone a good human being? Right? That's the bare minimum. I, John, that's like saying, parents, you want to know what it means to be a parent? All you have to do is put a roof over the baby's head, give him a crib to sleep in, and food on the table. You're done. And we'd say what? <laughs> That's just where it starts, right? That's the bare minimum of what it takes to be a parent. And so John, I believe, is not, is not saying that this is all there is to receive Christ. This is the starting point. He uses these specific things because that's what his, th those people that asked him would relate to. But he's really pointing to larger things, to more general things. He's asking us to think about what kind of person does Christ ask us to be if he's going to dwell with us. And the answer is Christ wants us to be the kinds of people who are generous, who are honest, who keep our commitments who are people of our word, who are kind, who are compassionate, who are grateful. That's different, isn't it? That's bigger. These higher principles, that's what, that's what Christ needs to dwell in us. And oh, by the way, these things, generosity and kindness and compassion and honesty and commitment and gratitude, those things are, are the, the fruits of the Spirit the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as if that to, to receive the Spirit of Jesus Christ, to really receive the gift of the Spirit, is to be the kind of person that wants to be generous, that doesn't worry about hoarding, but rather wants to give away what they have of excess. To truly receive the Spirit of Christ is, is not to, to be tempted to cheat or steal or to extort or abuse. Why? Because we're grateful for what we have. And we see the people we're interacting with as human beings. We feel connection to them. Right? We empathize with them. We see them for the ways that they're similar to us and not for the ways that they're different. Right? When we do that, compassion is easy or easier. That's what John is asking us to embrace today. And I think it's so important and it has real relevance for us today. Because I believe that these things like generosity and kindness and compassion and honesty and commitments and gratitude, these are the things that we will be remembered for when it's all said and done. I have presided at many funerals, and I rather enjoy it. I enjoy them. I enjoy getting moved and, 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 and 
choked up by the, the power that, that, that life and death and resurrection bring. I'm honored to serve at every funeral. I love attending funerals because what I love and am inspired by most is when we have adult children stand here, sometimes they're in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they speak eulogies about their mom or dad who's passed away. And you know what those grown children of parents say at eulogies of the, for the funerals of their parents? Well, they don't talk about many material things. They don't talk about physical things. And they hardly ever mention a Christmas gift that they got in fourth grade or seventh grade or when they were 17. No, they speak about the higher things. They speak about how they remember how mom or dad was generous how mom or dad was honest, how mom or dad taught them to be committed, how mom or dad taught them how to be grateful, how mom or dad was kind and compassionate to others. It's beautiful, right? I mean, children remember about their parents, not the physical things, but these things, the very things that John the Baptist is calling us to embrace. And that's what brings me back to today. Because today, there's nine days left to Christmas, right? Now is when the real stress begins. I mean, if you haven't done your Christmas shopping yet, right? I went out to Target yesterday. It was shop with the cop day. And everybody was kind and nice, but, you know, stress level, people everywhere. Right now, it's in the, we're in full mode shopping mode here. And I think about, I think about our parents, here, sitting up in the front rows, bringing infants, children into the world in this past year, starting families, building, growing their families, the children that we blessed. I think about how next Tuesday or Monday or whenever you trade gifts over Christmas, I'm willing to bet that there's going to be a lot of physical things unwrapped, Pre toys, clothes, electronics, games. And I know that when we have first-time parents or second-time parents or every time a parent is bringing a child into the world, they're going to stress and agonize over things like pack and plays and baby Bjorn carriers and what to expect when you're expecting books and all of that. That's all okay. But I challenge us to be challenged by John the Baptist today. And as you think about your children that you're raising, as you think about the Christmas presents you're giving next week, Consider giving these gifts. Give people your generosity. Give them your honesty. Give them your compassion. Give them your kindness. Not only does this help us prepare ourselves to receive Christ years from now, when you and I have our funeral and our children and our friends stand up to eulogize us, they're not going to remember the gift that you're stressing over now about getting for next Tuesday. They're going to remember the ways that you were generous, kind, the way that you and I revealed the fruits of the Spirit. This is what we will be remembered for. That's why John the Baptist is so important this week. Thanks be to God.